All right, so in this episode, we're going to talk about Wellenstein, what it is, why it matters, and how to identify it on the EKG. So for this one, we're going to start with a case. You're dispatched for chest pain. You arrive on scene. You have a 56-year-old male. He's conscious alert. And states that he had an episode of chest pain and lasted about 30 minutes. Right before you got there, pain resolved. And so when you perform your initial exam, he's pain-free. So we've all ran this call, um, right? Maybe you got your refusal pad tucked in the back pocket of your pants, um, ready to go. But we go ahead, we do our assessment. We get our vital um, sign. And of course, I hope we get an EKG. And this is your initial. And so when you look at that, you go, hopefully your eyes go to V3 and V4, especially in kind of an unusual presentation and, and what's going on there. And so um, you, we see that the, the ST segment is somewhat straightened. Um, T wave's a little big. Your QTC looks wide. And uh, you have that weird T wave pattern, especially in V3, where it goes up and then down. So you have a biphasic T wave um, that's going up and down. That's uh, going to be the classic hallmark presentation um, for Wellenstein. So what is it? Um, that ECG there is representative of type A Wellens. That's the up and then down or biphasic T wave. And so what's happening here is this is a, a near complete occlusion of the LAD. Those where it was discovered. And so what happens uh, in essence is that the, something causes uh, the LED to become occluded and then something shifts, something happens, and we get a little bit of blood flow um, back to the affected part of the myocardium. That typically causes uh, a resolution of the chest pain or at least a significant reduction in symptoms. Um, and what you're actually seeing when you look at Wellens, because uh, there is type A and type B, is you're seeing um, what would have been ST elevation had you gotten a 12 lead at the time there was chest pain, you're seeing that ST elevation convert into what's called reperfusion T waves. So if you ever look at the EKGs of like a person, uh, like a STEMI patient who went and got cath, uh, in the affected region, they'll often have T wave inversion in those leads. Uh, it's just kind of uh, the ECG representation of the physiologic effects of reperfusion after an occlusion. And so you can see there, the there's another example, and so you're, you're you're seeing a little bit more of what we call type V Wellens, where you have the complete T wave inversion in in V2, V3, V4. You can notice the T waves are symmetric, um, which is not normal, right? T waves are supposed to be asymmetric. Uh, V1 is a decent example of what a normal T wave might look like, where the ascending limb has a a shallower slope than the descending limb. And so you can see, like in V3 and V4's case, the the T waves are extremely symmetric and inverted. We would expect uh, the T waves to be upright in those leads. So what are we looking for specifically? There's, like I said, two types. You have type A and type B. So type A is that classic straightened ST segment, biphasic T wave that goes up and then down. That's important to remember because there are other um, clinical presentations that create a biphasic T wave, but they all typically create T waves that go down and then up. The classic example is hypokalemia will cause low rolling biphasic T waves that are classically down and then up. And the, the, the up part, um, people often call a U wave, um, which is classic for hypokalemia. So in Wellenstein, it's going to go up and then down or have complete inversion. The reason you get the type A and B is in type A's case, that typically occurs earlier on, um, you're actually catching the T wave as it's, as it's fully inverted. Um, so a little bit later, we'll transition to type B. Either way, uh, this is a this is an ECG case that's extremely important because this can save a human life. Uh, you don't want to discredit this. You don't want to downgrade this. This person's risk of uh, a they already for sure have a critical lesion uh, of their coronary vessel, and are, their uh, likelihood that they're going to go back into full blown STEMI is extremely likely. So you should be transporting this patient to a PCI capable facility. Uh, or if you're in hospital, you should be activating uh, and or facilitating transport to a PCI capable, capable facility because uh, this patient's going to need emergent cath. So we go back to that initial case, and you can kind of see you actually get a little bit of both. You've got type A waveforms present in V3. You've got that classic biphasic up and then down. Um, and then in 4 and 5, you get a little bit more of the type B, that just classic T wave inversion um, indicative of reperfusion. 
So if we look at this one here, just another example, you've got, you could say V2 is maybe type A, it goes up and then down and then complete T wave or T wave inversion in V3, V4, and V5. Um, it's also important to note that for it to be Wellens, the patient needs to be either pain free or um, have a resolution of symptoms and needed to have ACS symptoms present prior. Um, you know, something I talk about all the time with EKGs is, is that there's a lot of EKG presentations that look the same, but are caused by different pathologies. You know, a good example of where you might see T waves that look like you see in V3 and V4 that are completely non ischemic or non occlusive in nature um, are things like cerebral T wave inversion which you see in a person with increased intracranial pressure. So um, again, it would be almost non-discernible. They just have giant uh, deep T wave inversion. The difference is gonna be in the patient presentation, right? Is it a is it a patient who presented with chest pain that resolved and now you see these flip T waves? Well, that's gonna be well as type B. Is it a person that, you know, was complaining of the worst headache of their life and started to develop uh, blurred vision and altered mental status, and you see these giant T waves, that's going to be science by CP. So the ECG necessarily isn't the most specific and sensitive diagnostic all the time. And I know we, we want it to be because it's so cheap and easy to do, but uh, it, all of this stuff has to get tied back in uh, to the clinical presentation of the patient. And just another example, so you kind of have some ideas of where it looks. So since it's since it's the LAD vessel that we're talking about, you're going to have the you're going to be looking for these changes in Wellens in you know the anterolateral leads because that's the the part of the heart that's perfused predominantly by the LED. Now keep in mind that's just the majority of patients. There are uh, patients that have like a wraparound LED that can get the inferior wall as well. So you would scan for this pattern anywhere, but the classic Wellens signs are typically denoted in V1 through V5, maybe V6. And again, you're looking for either the the type A pattern, which is what you see in V2 and V3 in this case, the biphasic up and then down and then and or the type B pattern, which is indicative or being indicated in V4 where you see that flipping of the T wave there. Okay, last example, this is a classic type B. We've got the T wave inversion, tall, big, symmetric, inverted T waves in V2, V3, V4, V5, V6. Again, if you showed me this EKG and said, hey, this is a person that, um, it's unconscious with uh, irregular respiratory pattern and unequal pupils, I'd say, okay, well, that's clearly cerebral T waves secondary to ICP. But you tell me that this is a 45 year old male who was sitting on the couch watching TV and had an episode of chest pain. And then right before you got there, his chest pain went away. Uh, then that, I'm going to go, that's Wellens type B. So, what's important about this? Um, the, the keynote thing is, is that this pattern is indicative of a major occlusion or critical lesion of one of their uh, coronary vessels. Um, the scary part is, is that they will present pain-free or with a significant reduction in symptoms, which can be very disarming to the provider. So do not forget, this patient is at high risk of occlusion. We do not want um, to sign this patient out or get an AMA. We definitely want to transport this patient. Ideally, we need to get them to a PCI capable facility. So you're gonna be watching for reocclusion, watching for decompensation as we rapidly transport, anticoagulate, and get them to where they need to go. All right, short and sweet this, this time. Thanks, guys.